Often what I tend to do is I'll pay up to a thousand pounds towards legal costs if you pick one of these solicitors. Uh, uh, okay, I was and if slightly you, more generous. If, if you, you pick all of it. Oh, no, no, the, thing with, <laughs> what, my, the mistake I made with that, I did that once mm -hmm. and then the legal bill on the other side turned out quite big because they kept going back more and more questions and nitpicking. And ah, the no, but very increased. clever, very clever. So then I capped it at a thousand. I said, right, I'm only paying up to a thousand. I tell you, value of commercial units have dropped because we learned that we, know, we don't need offices to work in. Mm and we don't need uh, uh, to go out to do our shoppings and so uh, let alone pubs you know <laughs> there's, there's a drink even before drink. <laughs> even before covid <laughs> and, uh, and i didn't drink either because uh, i'll uh, i'd rather get fat on food and i have as an investor not, let alone as a solicitor but as an investor i bought many units many commercial units pubs offices nightclubs uh, uh, even a sex club is here. I mean, I didn't know it was a sex club. Right? It wasn't operating as a sex club when I bought it. It, it was, was closed down. It's closed down. Right. It was closed down. I, and uh, I found it out after I bought it from the council. The, the agents never told me that, the council, because the council was very keen that I was converting it. They were so keen. Very supportive. They were very supportive. <laughs> they were too supportive. I, I got suspicious. Said, well, actually, being Shimon Rudig and very direct, I said, you've been too nice to me. What am I missing? <laughs> you know, you know when you get suspicious, mm, well, I'm missing something yes. here. What you're about to watch is about an hour of gold content around creative strategies with my good friend Simon Rudik and also our creative strategy solicitor. But the really good news is he's agreed to do a session every week. So make sure you register for that. Each and every week he's going to be running a session on creative strategies, teaching you those, answering your questions uh, as well. So now let's jump straight into the recording. Hey, I'm super excited today. We've got Shimon Rudik in our office today. He was here, we run a workshop yesterday and I thought actually whilst you're here, why not get a video so we can pick his brains around all things around creative strategies. Considering uh, Shimon, you're the person that put together uh, the original contracts in this country in doing kind of creative strategies uh, and certainly kind of 15 plus years ago, I don't think there was anybody doing it and you were teaching the teachers also in terms of how to do this. So before we get started, for somebody watching right now, help us understand what is it we, we are talking about when we say creative strategies outside the box type of transactions? Thank you. Uh, so what are creative strategies? The, the idea of creative strategies is to make money from properties in a different way than the traditional way, because the traditional way either doesn't work for that property or for that area, or uh, you want to make money when you don't have money, when many creative strategies are very useful for people that don't have much cash. So uh, instead of the traditional way of putting down 20, 30% deposit or even 10% deposit, some creative strategies allow you to make money from properties without having a deposit to put down uh, or using properties in the normal way to make much more cash flow. So th there are many different creative strategies that can be used to make more money. Uh, when uh, uh, 15 years ago, me and my business partner were teaching creative strategies and we were the first one, as you know, to teach 99% of the creative strategies out there. Uh, we wrote a set of manuals with over 50 creative strategies. So there are many ways you can make money from properties. Let's unpick some of those. So, for example, you mentioned uh, one you mentioned is to make more money from from a, a, a transaction. So that would be where you have you don't have to put the money in for the purchase. You're putting less money in. Yes. Well, if I want to make money from a property without putting money down, uh, the best or the most uh, useful strategies are lease option and assisted sale. Um, lease option if you want to keep the property uh, for, and an assisted sale is kind of uh, um, trading uh, if you want to sourcing, but instead of making a little bit of money, you make 10 times more than the normal way. While if you want to use a strategy where uh, you don't, don't want to put cash in, uh, it's the same thing, that you use the same framework and you don't you don't need the money so assist sale and uh, lease options uh, and add deductions for example also if instead with the same property i want to make much more cash flow i will use strategies like uh, uh, sales accommodations uh, that will increase my cash flow greatly so in essence we're controlling the property rather than owning it rather than purchasing it so we take control 
and then we depending on what we want to do with it so let's say we're talking about assisted sale and ordinarily if i'm flipping a property i'm having to purchase it put the money down for the purchase or maybe it's a deposit and some other finance then there's a the money to spend on to renovate and then sell or hopefully make a profit so how's that different in assisted sale very good it's, it's actually spot on so if i want to flip a property in the normal way i have to buy it do so spend maybe one hundred thousand pounds to buy it then spending maybe two three ten thousand pounds to do some works and then maybe i flip it for one hundred fifty thousand pounds and i still make maybe forty thousand pounds profit uh, while we create strategies like assisted sale i don't need to buy the property up front so i don't need the one hundred thousand pounds to buy it i only need the money to do it up so you control the property like quite correctly you mentioned and uh, and I, I don't and I, I never bought it I will never buy it I just control it spend a few thousand pounds to make it more sellable and add value and then I sell it uh, still 150,000 pounds and uh, my profit is still just 40,000 pounds but instead of needing 110,000 pounds to make 40,000 pounds I maybe need a three or ten thousand pounds so there is uh, a more more profit to be made as a percent of the yield instead of using 110 to make 40 i only need 10,000 pounds and there is also more opportunities for me because it depends how much money i have in my pocket yes if yeah. i have only 110,000 pounds in my pocket i can do only one flip per time in the normal way if i have 110,000 pounds in my pocket and i use an assisted sale i can do 11 of them at the same yes. time so let's say you own the property, for example, and I'm doing assisted sale with you. So rather than me purchasing your property, I'm just putting in the renovation money and cost uh, to, to get it all set up for the contracts. And so when I sell, my return on investment is significantly higher because it's based on a smaller input rather than the larger amount to do the acquisition. Absolutely, absolutely. So that, that is exactly how it works. Okay, so I guess people watching now, and especially if they're hearing this kind of thing for the first time, first thing I think, why on earth would somebody do that? That's the first question that often jumps to people's minds. So what circumstances, what things lead to people willing to want to allow you to control the property in this way? Well, very good. So they, they, we are looking for people that have properties on the market that are not selling. So the property is not selling. And not been, for example, it's been on the market for six or 10 months, 12 months. And uh, if you know how to find that there are hundreds of properties like this in any area around the country, because we are, we are in a bias market, so there is a lot of property that are not selling. So you're going to see the property and, uh, and you find out why it's not selling. So first you work like uh, Sherlock Holmes, for example, and, uh, and you have to find the clues on why the property is not selling. And there can be various reasons. And it could be that it's outside, you know, there is the grass this high. A dead uh, ugly ivy growing on the front, actually not growing anymore, dead on, on the front wall. And uh, the, the, the fence is collapsing. Uh, or is the inside? Uh, there is a bit of damp here. And uh, the, the kitchen is, is dirty, let alone the toilet uh, that no one has been cleaning and there is mold all over it. Uh, or there is something on, on the back. So you, first you work as, 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 as an investigator finding the clues on what is causing people not to buy it and then you work as a house doctor you fix it yes so you spend a few thousand pounds in fixing it yes and uh, and then now the property can be sold really for its real value and it becomes a win-win scenario with the vendor because the vendor gets exactly what he wanted yes and then you get make the profit so in a certain way you're like an agent but instead of making 1% profit on the sale, you make 15, 20% profit. Super estate agent. A super estate, super estate agent. agent. And I remember for those that might be my age, I'm going to age you a little bit, in the, um, I think it was in the 90s, there used to be a, a TV program called The House Doctor. I think it was a Canadian woman uh, used to go around the properties that weren't selling and she'd kind of just make them look nicer, more appealing, more homely, and then they would sell. Yeah. So it's it's identifying sometimes there's an issue that the seller's having personal issues sometimes it could be issue with the property yeah that they're having and it's for us looking at how can we fix those problems without necessarily doing uh, a normal acquisition yeah, spot on. well i wasn't in the uk at the time i was still living in in rome so there was not a program about that's spot on that's exactly what, yeah. how it works and 
so with that type of uh, strategy, uh, clearly the legals need to be done quite correctly. And that's kind of like your background and how it uh, come about. And uh, I remember when I first did some of these uh, transactions, uh, in my head, I thought it's very straightforward and simple, but actually the legal documents need to be put together correctly to protect the seller, protect the buyer, and make sure the future buyer, the transaction done the right way and all the monies are dispersed correctly. Uh, you're spot on. So that's the reason why my background as a solicitor, as a partner at MS No Solicitors, uh, came quite handy. Uh, because I'm both a solicitor and a property investor. I actually bought my first property when I was still a trainee solicitor. So to ensure that the legal framework is the correct one, is, is paramount, and, and the, the devil can be in the details. I've seen many times, uh, exactly, when people didn't have uh, the correct paperwork, spend the money on the property, and then the vendor sells the property to someone else. Yes. And, uh, you know, not very useful. Yeah. There. You know, thank you very much for your generous uh, refurbishing my yes. property. <laughs> very kind of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when we talk about these type of creative strategies, sometimes people use terms like uh, purchase lease options, um, uh, or, or, or kind of a PLO agreements or something. They're very generic terms that they're using. So you, earlier you touched on a lease option. Um, How is a lease option different from, say, an assisted sale? Uh, very good. So a lease option gives you the control of the property to buy it in, sometimes in the future. So you have the right, but not the obligation, to buy the property. So you have, for example, the right to buy number 13 Market Street within the next 10 years or 10 months or two years, then you decide it's something you agree with the vendor, right? So, and for a fixed amount of money, let's say 200,000 pounds, and, and you will be paying a monthly fee to the vendor, whether it is a fixed fee or what, or the mortgage payments. And, and then you have a number of months, years to make it work for you and buy it. With an assisted sale, the aim is never to buy it yourself. Mm. So you so you assist in the sale. To you sell assist it. in the, I mean, the paperwork is similar, although it's different because uh, in, officially you still have the right to buy it for two hundred thousand pounds. But in reality, you will never buy it. You will just find another buyer, and uh, and you make the money in the difference. They complete the purchase, and they you, complete. You, so you you never bought the property. Yeah. So also from a tax point of view, it's much better that way. Yes. So on a lease option, then. It's essentially more of a longer term arrangement. It could be a year, it's, it's 20 more, years. Not necessarily because I have done both for my clients and mm -hmm. for myself a short lease options. It's more uh, what is the aim in mind? Okay. The aim is am I going to keep it or I'm going to sell it? Mm -hmm. If I'm keeping it, I'm doing a lease option because if I want to sell it, rather, if I know that I'm going to sell it to a third party, I'm doing an assisted sale. Because the lease options, to speak, it shouldn't give you the, the options, if you want, yeah, yeah. and uh, to sell it. When I see the sell, you're aiming to sell, so you want to make sure that the contract gives you the, the right to sell the property to a third party. Yes. I remember when I first figured this out, initially it took me a little while to get going with these, because uh, when I first learned this, I would turn up to a seller and say, right, let me tell you about all the million different ways we can do this deal. Now, <laughs> like, one minute my knowledge all over them, and they'd be going like this. And I'd, I'd lose them completely because I just overwhelm them with information. Uh, so the approach and how we have the conversation is absolutely critical with the, with the seller. And there's many properties I, I picked up at the time. When I look back a, a year or two later, I was thinking, why on earth did I uh, do that deal? And it was because it was easy. It was just like they're literally throwing the keys at you. And But later on, many of them turned good because... Uh, as the market rose, the price went up quite significantly, and those that were making a little bit of cash flow started uh, having a lot of equity uh, in those. So when I'm when I think about lease options, I think about long term. Um, uh, I've got a property now that effectively I'm paying a monthly payment on. As you said, that could be um, it could be a lease payment, a rent payment. Um, it could be um, uh, money is going towards servicing the seller's debt, as it were. But it's a, a period of time that we have that property for. And as you said, we've got the right to buy it, but we're not obligated. We're not committed. We don't have to buy it. Yes. We can walk away. And that's a critical thing um, uh, in this, that uh, we can actually walk away. It's very useful because like this, it gives you an extra exit strategy. When, when you buy your property, what are your exit strategies? I rent it out. I live in it or I sell it and practice in any other any property you buy you have three options 
And if you bought it as an investment and uh, in five years time they build, they decide to build a nice prison next to it or a landfill, chances are that mm -hmm. the value of the property is going to drop. Yes. And if you bought it, now you're stuck with the lemon. And if you want to sell it, you will sell it at a loss. Well, if you had the lease option, you just d decide not to buy it. And, you can, and the vendor can also say, oh, but you told me you were going to buy. I said, I wanted to buy. I, I still committed it, but, you know, take with the law mayor that decided to put the landfill next to it or the, the latest prison, you know, is not going to make the proper, property popular. So it gives you an extra extra strategy. Yeah, and you're not pulling the wool over the seller's eyes at the Absolutely beginning not. way. They, they, they are aware that you're not obligated to purchase. Absolutely, then there is this, it's, it's paramount, it's from the very beginning when I stepped into this, because I wasn't the first one to teach this option. All the other credit strategies, yes, because this option started 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago in the States. But the first people that used to teach this option in this country, they didn't care to do it legally at all. Mm. For them it was like, you know, whatever, just a piece of paper. And so- Because the idea was imported from uh, America, South Africa, Australia. Australia. So they, yeah. they, 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 ironically, from the get go, it was incorrect because uh, they're called lease options, but there is no lease. There's no lease, yeah. <laughs> because uh, a lease will be making a breach in the, in the mortgage condition other way. And uh, so they're called lease options because in the States, uh, a lease is the tenant's agreement. Yeah. And the way lease option is done in the States uh, is that uh, you grant a tenant's agreement to a tenant. And you give him also the right to buy sometime in the future and the obligation that he has to look after the property. Something that obviously you cannot do in this country. So the, the, the first people to do this option in this country, their paperwork was totally enforceable. Mm. And then no, no valid, no legal, no, no, that was wrong. So my first claim to fame in, in the property market was when uh, we, we stepped in and we spent money with the barrister because we had some ideas, but we wanted to make sure that it was, was right. And we created the first set of uh, lease option agreement. They were both legal and enforceable. And again, people might be thinking, you know, I, I can see the benefit for us as an investor, but why on earth would a seller allow you to do this? Well, you have to make it win-win, of course, right? So you have to find out why the seller is selling. Because uh, homeowners that sell their property, they don't sell it uh, necessarily because they, they want to make a profit. They, they're not, they didn't buy the profit as an asset to make money like us. The, 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 the business is not trading properties and making profit, uh, profit from properties. The, their business is something else. So people sell their homes because they have a problem or a need. They, they need to upgrade, they have to uh, uh, upside, no, they have more kids. They need to downside because the kids have moved out. They, they need to relocate because of their jobs. They, they, they need to change house because they're divorcing. So the demand that in financial difficulties, the, 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 the bank is knocking at the door. So you need to find out, your job at the beginning is to find out what is the real reason why they're selling and then finding a solution to the reason without selling. So if they have a problem and I find a solution to, to their problem without selling the property, then it becomes win-win. I mm. solve the problem and now I'm controlling the property will I will make money. Uh, that, that is, is the idea behind it and that is how it works. So for example, if let's say somebody's relocating for work and uh, you know, they're moving to Manchester, I don't know why they want to leave Birmingham to no, to Manchester me, anyway, but let's say they're moving off to Manchester, they don't necessarily want to be a landlord and they've been trying to sell the property or rent it and that hasn't kind, kind of delivered what they want. This scenario allows them to effectively walk away from having to worry about running and upkeep and managing that property whereas the investor is taking it on, taking all that responsibility yes. uh, and will uh, at some point probably purchase uh, yes. as well. And, uh, you know, my, my conversation with sellers has often been when they say to me, well, what if you don't buy it? Well, I say, well, look, you know, personally, when I do these type of uh, deals, I'll probably spend a little bit of money on the property to improve the property, uh, make it compliant and, and stuff as well, make sure for lettings point of view, everything's in order. Uh, and over time, it's very likely property values will go up. So actually, if I don't buy it, how are you worse off? You're probably better off. Yeah. You've got a property that's worth more, probably in better condition. And uh, hence, for that same reason, it's very likely I will buy it uh, uh, as well. So it gives them the confidence. Now, yeah, uh, it's actually interesting, man, because I also add one thing in fairness. I also tell them, 
if after 10 years I haven't bought it, uh, I paid your mortgage for 10 years. Yeah. You know, do you, uh, <laughs> I know asking the money back. So, yes. <laughs> you, know, at, you know, you said, thank you, Shimon, for paying my mortgage for 10 years. You yeah, know? that's true. It's true. So just to summarize on the lease option, then before we kind of dissect further, which is what I'd like to do, is you're, you're paying a, a consideration up front. So an amount has to be paid to commit to the uh, yeah. arrangement. You agree a term. Yes. Could be anything, a month, 20 years. Um, what's the longest? Uh, but there isn't a theory. Yeah, I think mean, 21 years is the longest I've done. I haven't let it run for 21, but that's the longest option. Uh, yeah, I, I'm had. not the... As an investor, just to listen, do whatever you want. As an investor, I prefer to keep them short because, you know, if I like to find ways to make money in the next two, three years yeah. rather than waiting 10 years. Yes. So I, pay, as, as an investor, I mean, as a solution, my law firm has done very long lease options. But as an investor, I don't think I've ever done any lease option more than five years. Yeah. I think actually my longest one is was, uh, I mean, it uh, was five years, but uh, I'll... Uh, I'll exercise the option within 12 months. I, I never kept any option for more than 12 months. Okay. Because I manage always to sort whatever is the problem within yes. 12 months. Yeah, turn it around. And like you say, it depends on the strategy you're, you're, you're uh, implementing, what your yes, objective, what absolutely. your goal is, what you're trying to do. So with that then, uh, so I said, you've got a term agreed, you've got consideration you're paying, then you've got to pay a monthly payment, which is effectively like the lease bit, as yeah. it were, that you're paying as well. Those three things have to be in place. For, for that too. Yeah, to, to there might be other terms, you know, at the end of the day, if the vendor wants, you know, needs that his dog is taken out every Monday, I'll pay someone to take the door for, for an hour out 10 pounds. You can agree. If I'm, <laughs> I agree to that if he makes me 100,000 pounds in yeah. five years time, the property. Um, so the other thing sometimes people, I guess, confuse is options and lease options. What's the difference between the two? Well, having an option to buy doesn't mean that you're controlling the property. You just have the option to buy. It's like uh, options usually more loose for development. Yes. So, I don't know, like big developers, uh, Barrett's Homes, a thing like that. They find some nice piece of land that may be agricultural. They don't have any planning permission. They are not interested to, to occupy the property. And besides, it's land. There's nothing. You know, that they're not interested in growing wheat or, or oats. And so they have an option on the land and, and they're aiming to get planning. If they get planning now, the property is worth 10 times more, so they got, but they locked it cheaply. And if they don't get planning, they lost only a little bit of money for getting the option. So an option is just the, the, is a tool that you use when you're hoping that you add value, but you're not interested in occupying. Yes. While a lease option, you want to occupy the property, either because you want to put you want to live in a house that you cannot afford to buy. So maybe there is option on a property that, uh, you know, and nice and nice property that you could afford to buy right now, whether because you don't have the deposit uh, or, or your credit scoring is not exactly what you want it to be, or you just started a, a new business is making a huge amount of money, mm -hmm. but in not, not enough credit history. Or you want to occupy because you want to put tenants. Yes. Like this, not only you can benefit for, from the capital appreciation, you also benefit from the rents coming in every day. And, uh, or you want to do works on the property. And then it, you open to different kind of strategies like uh, assisted sale, ugly duckling, uh, where you spend considerable amount of money yeah. and you redevelop the, the property. No? You, you either you can, with, an, with a slice and dice uh, and the strategy, there's a title splitting you, you might, from this big house, you make four flats or six flats, or you're in an ugly duckling and you have a property that is, you know, been nuked and, uh, and needs a full refurbishment mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, or is a property that has subsidence, or you, you add value by extending uh, sideways, backwards, yes. upwards, you know. So wanting to have control gives you the option to, to, to add a lot of value by and you have to spend money there. So that opens the, 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 the room for more advance. Yes. For more yeah. investors for much more money. So for example, we have a car park next to our office just here and I could, uh, in theory, agree an option agreement on that car park, yeah. which would give me the right to buy it at some point in the future. We have to agree the price today. Yeah. Um, and uh, then I could go and apply for planning permission to build a block of 20 apartments, for example. Yes. And then the value will increase significantly because of the, the planning process I've, I've gone through. Uh, and then the uh, I could then purchase either that 
property and then develop, uh, sorry, purchase the land and develop, or I could sell the whole Absolutely. option on to somebody else because I've made paper profit. I could now realize Absolutely. that by selling somebody else. And a, the example of the car park is very good because either you can just have an option. So the car park still stays with the original owner and it still runs it as a, as a car park. Or you, you get a lease option or uh, there are such as like storage millionaire or whatever. And uh, and you control the, the land and you're making money from the rent that comes or the, the cash flow comes from putting cars yes. or storage containers or whatever. So the the, the details is, is important and, and, and what you want out of it. Do you want to want just the end bit or also the interim mm. and uh, and quite correctly maybe you don't want to pay bob the builder and then yes. well what should they do then? i guess they make a lot of money because now this piece of land that uh, as a car park is worth one thousand pounds and now that he has plenty permission for 50 flats worth uh, i don't know twenty thousand pounds each is now worth the gdv is 10 million pounds you know <laughs> maybe nice worth two, two million pounds why do want to do it in my hands and just find someone that pays it for that yes and in that example again when you think well why would the seller even agree to an option agreement they think um because when until you've had the conversation with sellers until you 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 start speaking to people who are open to these kind of things it can be quite difficult to comprehend so in the example you just gave um the let's say the land is worth a hundred thousand today that car park but i could agree to pay them two hundred thousand i could agree to pay them twice what that's worth yes if I get my uh, relevant That's uh, very, movies. very good. That is one of the reasons, well, the main reason why I create this statue, but one of my favorite reasons is that I don't have to browbeat the vendor on the price. I don't have to negotiate and push down and push down and push down. You want 200,000 pounds, I give you 100,000 pounds. You want 200,000 pounds, the, the fact that the, the, the property or the land is not worth that amount of money is totally relevant to me. Yes. What is relevant to me is what is going to be worth after I add my Chimon bit. Yes. And, and like this, I can be very generous. And also in, in my marketing, you know, like, for example, the most common way of doing marketing is in properties leaflets, I guess. Now, everybody, the leaflets can be of different shape, colors, and, and wording, but there are some very standard, basic uh, sentences that everybody puts in the leaflets in properties. We buy any kind of property, we're going to be discreet, we are going to be extra fast, and uh, we will take care of everything. Now, either we don't mention anything about how much we are willing to pay, or... Uh, uh, some people will say we pay up to market value, although it's not true. <laughs> because if you're an investor, you want to make profit, you buy for less than what is market value. Uh, but in my leaflets, I can put, uh, we pay w up to 120% of market value. So I get the vendor who's like, what? You pay more than what is worth it. So when they get uh, your leaflet and they get my leaflet, you know, they say, mm, I call Shimon, you yeah. know, I call the Ghostbusters. <laughs> they, 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 there, there, uh, there is an idiot called Shimon that pays more. Why should I sell it to someone else? Yes. And and I can't pay more because I don't. I, how much, as you mentioned very correctly, how much is worth now is not important to yes, me. Yes, it was what it could be worth. And uh, I, that reminded me. There's an advert I used to run the newspaper years ago. I used to put, I used to put on one of the adverts. I pay uh, uh, up to 10, over ten thousand pounds market value. And I would get yeah. unindated in calls. Yeah. Most of them obviously didn't go anywhere, but it initiate the conversations. Yes. And there are leads within that yeah, very uh, clever, that you very can clever. you can translate into a, into a deal. So uh, I want to kind of dissect things a little bit further. But before we do that, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, previously you'd written a manual with a huge number of strategies in that. Yes. Manual. Remind me how many strategies? Are 54, 54. 54 strategies. Yeah, yeah. So many different ways these strategies can be applied. And one of the things you are now uh, going to do, we were talking about this earlier on, on a weekly basis, you're going to be running a masterclass online. Yes, absolutely. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? So on a weekly basis, on Thursday night, we are going to run a, a weekly webinar for you guys, you're all free, you can join. And we, I will teach uh, three strategies, three okay. creative strategies. And uh, uh, I might touch on also others, but mainly it's a deep dive on three strategies. And uh, we will we will start with something very uh, simple like uh, rent to rent, mm -hmm. uh, which is the entry basis for everybody because you don't need any money with rent to rent. Rent to rent, you just uh, rent someone else's property and then rent it up for a higher figure. Yeah. Now, 
although I was the first one to teach rent to rent in this country, in our manual it's called guaranteed rent. I actually don't like rent to rent. So I don't. We're, we're going to talk about that in a moment. We're going to talk about rent to rent separately in a moment. <laughs> and then the next thing that we're going to teach uh, slice and dice, which is a great strategy for uh, adding value on properties uh, which already are. Uh, different uh, in one title but they're different or you create more properties we are going to teach assisted sale which you mentioned before that uh, sourcing but on steroids and then uh, uh, last but not least we are going to teach uh, commercial conversions that is the next level kind of because the others were more simpler and uh, for everybody commercial conversion is more for uh, seasoned investors where you can make much more money from bigger projects yeah. uh, and uh, with bigger funds. I think, yeah, I so this is, uh, you'll be doing this every week. We'll yeah. put a link uh, also on the screen and also in the description as well for people to be able to access and register for that and uh, guest questions you'll be answering as well on that. So it'll be a live session we'll be running yes. every week. Excellent. So uh, we talked about a lease option. Yes. We talked about the option part, which can be separate to a lease option. Yeah. Let's just talk about just the lease part, which sometimes all can be talked about as rent to rent. Just the uh, ah, have very the right good. to buy. So, when uh, over 15 years ago we started teaching it, uh, it was like uh, I'm not saying that it is the way to get investors interested in, but it's easy to make people understand that you can make money without actually buying the property. Yeah. So you lease, or you're not really leasing because otherwise you 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 breach in the contract. So you offer. A, a landlord a guaranteed rent and that uh, and then you your idea is to make money between the difference of what you promise the vendor and that's the reason why in our mind called guaranteed rent because why would the lender agree yeah. because he has now security he doesn't have to deal with tenants he doesn't have to deal with managing agents rental voids maintenance and things like that so that is the benefit for the lender and and what is the benefit for me because i agree a rent that is less than what usually should be and then i find a way to make more money by putting a higher paying tenant and that the difference between the two is my profit yes now that one was easy to sell it as a concept and uh, uh, because it doesn't need any money mm. it really it needs close to no money and literally the biggest expense is the legal fees i think it's fair <laughs> and <laughs> but uh, uh and in fairness, you don't even need a solicitor every time on a, on a, on on a rent to rent. It can almost be like a template. Yeah, so you, you pay the solicitor first time for the template, and then you use the same template. Whereas on a lease option, a CCL, you would not do. You no, not you, you you have to you make to make sure that not only there is a solicitor, but both parties are represented. represented yeah. You need to protect yourself. Something you know, especially if the vendor wants to change his mind, a thing like that. Uh, but as an investor, I don't like rent to rents because once I get hold of a property and I make it to, to in, in a cash flow cow. Why should I give it back to the, mm. the, the original owner eventually? I want to keep it. So for me, the rent to rent was the foot in the door. Yeah. So for many people that teach rent to rent and rent to rent is something that even uh, some of our listeners and viewers watching now probably have heard the term, come across a term. Um, it's, it's something that bandied around quite a lot, but most teach in the same in the same standard way. Yes. But what you're talking about is doing something a little bit different with it. Absolutely. You know, because uh, the way the other people teach it is for them just, uh, you make some cash flow. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in total little money. I'm more interested in the big money. And I'm not saying that I'm greedy, but I have eight kids, guys, so <laughs> I need the money. about to feed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, eight kids, uh, one dog, two cats, you know, they, they comes, they, it doesn't come simply. So for me, is the foot in the door. So once I get the landlord, to like the idea, then I, I stick in, I bring, you know, but I like also the option to buy them sometime mm. in the future. So, uh, and the whole idea is that uh, losing a, a negotiation technique called the Nibo. Yeah. So you don't ask everything right away. Yes. So you ask a little bit. Uh, so first I get the vendor to warm to the idea of a guaranteed rent mm. uh, and he gets all the benefits. And then, oh, by the way, we also want the option to buy it. Uh, because otherwise, and I'm not interested to rent other people's properties because uh, you become just a glorified managing agent. I don't want to manage my own properties. Yes. I don't want a nine to five job. I want to make money from my properties without with doing nothing. It's never 100% passive, but certainly don't want a nine to five job. So the rent to rent for me is the foot in the door to get more options. Yes. And I think the, uh, the, the thing with this is the concepts are relatively simple. 
Yes. But it's the intricacies on how you do them, how you set them up, the conversations you have. And you touched on, you know, one of my favorite techniques here, nibbling, uh, in terms of when we're doing a, a deal. And I remember when it was first described to me and the person said, look, you know, if my son comes up and says to me, dad, um, can I... Um, uh, you know, can I can I go out with my friends today? And I think, okay, well, you know, that's fine. And then he comes back a couple of hours later and says, oh, dad, can I can I have 50 pounds because I'm going to go out with my mm -hmm. friends today? He'll agree uh, to that. And he might come back a couple of hours later and says, oh, and would it be possible for me to, to borrow your car today uh, as well? You might agree on that. He might come back again and say, oh, and can I stay over tonight and uh, stay out tonight? Uh, where versus if he turned up and said, Dad, can I have the car? Can I have 50 pounds? I'm going to out with my friends. I'm going to stay over tonight. The answer is probably going to be no, because it's too much too soon. Yeah. So you do it a little, little bit at a time. And just like you described, when we're doing these type of deals, it's how you present them, how you have the conversation makes a huge amount of difference between what turns into a deal and what turns into this yeah, is not yes, going anywhere. Well, you couldn't be more correct. So is the knowledge of the strategy is only part mm. of the of the of, of, of what you need to do learning uh, how to speak to the vendor uh, or, or the landlord and uh, or the agents because sometimes you have to yes. deal with the managing agent yeah. or estate agents so learning what to say and what and how to present it uh, is is as important because you might have uh, the best solution to the problem but if you say it in Chinese, mm -hmm. the vendor is not going to agree, right? So you have to learn how to do the get to the point, get to what is good for him and how to present it. It is very important. Yeah, and this this was the biggest mistake I made when I started out uh, in doing creative strategies, as I learned all the theory, but actually I didn't learn the techniques to speak to the sellers in the right way or the owners to to. Yeah, get I, the deal I used done. to do a similar and uh, I I didn't give them too much information so you were doing the mistake of giving too much too information because yes. it creates more questions oh yeah. how does this work then and how what about this and what about that and and you end up answering more and more questions i was doing create a more confusion mistake i being uh, shimon i used to talk too much and keep talking and talking and talking shimon and, you don't talk a lot no nah, absolutely <laughs> not they said i can talk for england for some reason so i had to learn to you know especially when the vendor says oh i'm interested well, shut up and get to the point, you know, Shimon, yes. <laughs> get him to sign the papers, you know. Yeah, so I have a term saying, uh, don't sell beyond the sale. Once something's been agreed, shut up then, don't keep talking. And yeah, well, there, there is talking a special out of kiss. It. Remember a kiss? Keep it simple, stupid. Yes. And and I, I, I did the, the we, we, we all learn from our mistakes. They, they said that a clever person learns from your mistakes. And a cleverer person learns from other people's mistakes. Else's mistakes yeah. That is how I started teaching. They, at the beginning, they used to ask me what things to avoid and not to lose money. And because I, when I started, there weren't people running courses, mentorships, yes. network events. It was very much trial and terror, as you can yes. imagine. 20, well, 24 years ago, I bought my first property. So I made a lot of cost, costly mistakes. Yes. So being creative is, is useful, but uh, when you, you don't have anyone to compare, to talk mm -hmm. to, and you like to be creative, some something that I tried, they were like, uh, in theory, were like very good. Yes. Where and perhaps so good in practice. And that reminds me of something else. Well, I remember there's many deals I lost, and I lost money on them as well. Let me explain. What I would do, I'd agree the deal with the seller, and the seller would say, okay, right, I'm going to go and speak to my solicitor now, and... Uh, um, get your solicitor to talk to them. And at that point, I didn't realize at the time, but that deal was doomed. Yes. Because the solicitor didn't necessarily have the right experience or understanding of these type Absolutely. of agreements. And to be nice about it to the solicitor, the solicitor was not going to say to their client, no, I don't understand this. Take it to someone else. Yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. Rather than trying to figure it out, it would be a case of they'd give them a million reasons not to do it. Yes, I'll, I'll absolutely. Talk about the deal. Well, one of the things that I always teach my students exactly that is, is paramount that the vendor use a solicitor of your choice. And you, you, you give the characteristic solution here. You incentivize him by telling them, not first of all, you tell them, not every solicitor knows this stuff. Yeah, it's, and, uh, that, that's it's my very, point. This is very, very, very specialist knowledge. Yeah, it's an issue. Like if you have a problem with your eye, you don't go to the podiatrist, do you? Yes. So if you want to do this kind of stuff, you need a solicitor that is experienced. So now you can choose any solicitor you want, but your solicitor has to tell me that it does at least 20 of this one every month, like my solicitor. If not, 
we are both wasting time. Mm. Now, it's your prerogative wasting time, but my time is very valuable. And I put, and so I'm not prepared to waste time, but I put the money where the mouth is. Yes. In order for me not to waste time, and, and, and when I say that my time is worth more, is very valuable, i rather pay for your solicitor as long as your solicitor is someone that has experience, then you pay the solicitor that knows nothing yes. about this thing. Yeah, because it's it's not likely to go anywhere. The deal will just drag on and on, and yeah. it'll probably fall out of bed. You'll incur costs. No, you, you've been too too too, gen too, too polite <laughs> regarding solicitors because many of those solicitors have too much of a big ego to say, no, what 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 is this? So yeah, yeah, I know about it. No, you cannot do this. You cannot do this. You cannot do it because they don't understand it. Yeah, if it's not. It can't be done. They don't understand how to do. Yeah, it. because there is. If they were, <coughs> ironically, if they go for a, a a higher level kind of solicitor, like a commercial solicitor, not that they go because no one will pay three times more yeah, for a commercial solicitor when you're doing for a little house, right? But a commercial solicitor will appreciate it because a lease. Now it's real lease. On a commercial, it will be a lease. A lease with an option to buy is not uncommon. Yeah, so, it's not uncommon. Yeah, so, for example, I could rent a shop um, yeah. from a landlord on a long lease and agree with them at some point I'll purchase it in the yes, future. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And so that's a lease option, but it's more common in the commercial world. Yes, and the same thing on title splitting. On, on a lease, I might have the, the right to split the units. Mm. In the, 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 the commercial unit is smaller ones, like industrial units and things like that. On a residential, you you put it to a normal conveyance in solicitor and it goes like, what? You want to split this house in floods? No. <laughs> Why? Why would you allow that? So the the but a normal vendor, no, so the selling his home, a normal homeowner is not going to go to a big firm and pay four thousand pounds yeah. for a single conveyancing. Yeah, and it, as you said, there's many ways you can incentivize them um, in terms of uh, yeah. getting that done. Often what I tend to do is I'll pay up to a £1,000 towards legal costs if you pick one of these solicitors. Uh, ah, okay, I was and if slightly you, more generous. If you pick all of it. Oh, no, no, the, thing with, <laughs> what, but the mistake I made with that, I did that once, mm -hmm. and then the legal bill on the other side turned out quite big mm -hmm. because they kept going back more and more questions and nitpicking. And ah, no, but very increase. clever, very clever. So then I capped it at 1,000. I said, right, I'm only paying up to 1,000. I'll tell you a mistake that one of my students was doing. I didn't realize it. He was telling to the vendor, we pay your legal fees, full we'll stop. And, and then what happened is that sometimes vendors decided not to proceed. And he still not only didn't get the deal. Yes. He had to pay, pay both the legal bill. fees yeah, and the yeah. other fees. So you have to tell yes. the vendor, we pay your fees. But actually, on successful no, completion, on the, within solicitor, they said yeah. that it's only completion. So, so, like this, if you change your mind, well, then you know there is has to be an incentive while you yeah. you you close the deal with me because otherwise you end up paying the, the solicitor fees now. Yeah, and that's I, I learned all these things by uh, the hard way like, by like, making the mistakes. <laughs> exactly, like all of us. Um, so you also touched on another interesting topic just a moment earlier. You mentioned about title splitting. Yes. So let's let's talk about how title splitting can work within the the realms of doing oh. something creative. So, well, that is one of my creative strategies, uh, my, my, my favorite creative strategy because uh, in in our well, course, first first of all, tell us what it means. What is what is the splitting of titles? The split of is the idea is that you have well, there are two different two whether it is already like a block of flats, for example on one title and you're only splitting from one freehold in maybe 10 leaseholds. Mm -hmm. So you get a solution to create 10 leaseholds. Anything, well, in practice, you don't do anything physically it's to add paperwork. value. It's yeah. only paperwork and uh, and and the solicitor charges you for that. Yeah. I think it's still fair. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but, this will add a lot of value to the property when you're borrowing. Now, if you're not borrowing, it's not that useful. But if you're borrowing, you can buy a block of flats on a field for a certain amount of money. And just by time title split it and remortgage get much more money that way. Or if you do on the same day, you don't even have to, to buy it with that money. So that that is the simplest way to do a, a title split or slice and dice. That is how it was called. In so essentially, mind. what we what we're doing in that is we we're taking on a property um, uh, which contains multiple units. Yes, and we are then breaking it up yes. because the breakup value will be higher yes. than the combined uh, value as a single. So, and, and that primarily is because. 
there's fewer buyers available for a block as there is for individual units. Yeah, well, whether we keep it or, or sell it is, uh, if I want to sell it, and absolutely, if I sell it then by splitting then, especially it, uh, not only when there is a block of flats, when it's uh, uh, mixed used. Mm -hmm. So some residential, no, no, there might be some shops above, uh, sorry, some flats above a shop. How many people are going to buy a shop and the and, and the flats above? Is it, no, may, there are plenty, but yeah. There are many fewer, more people. Buyers, yeah. yeah, there are many, many more people that will buy just the shop yes. or just the flats. And like this, you and you want to have the biggest uh, amount of people willing to buy your property because you know the more people buying, and you know brings the price up. Yes. And so, if you want to sell it, what the, the, the is is a no-brainer. But even if you want to keep it, uh, the lender, we say fact that you can have different lenders. Instead of having the and so you open options to to different lenders, they might be cheaper because not every lender will agree to do mixed use mm. or, or large block of flats, even if it's residential. Because or block of flats, lending, yeah. you, you, you will have to go down the commercial route from lending, which is a more expensive, oh. and b, if you are at the beginning of your journey in property. A lender is not going to lend you on commercial lending. Yeah, it could uh, be lower loan to value as well. And, and mm. so you you add, you add value by splitting because, as you mentioned correctly at the, be at the beginning, uh, the, the 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 value of of as a one title and uh, is smaller than the value of different titles put together. Mm. Uh, but or you may decide that I want just to keep the flats and I don't care about the shop below. Yeah. And uh, so maybe it's, and, it's... and there's many, especially around here, actually, where we are uh, in this part of Birmingham, there's a lot of old, very nice, beautiful, large properties over the years have been converted to flats because they were just too big. Yeah. Uh, but may, they may not have been converted correctly. They might not have complied with building regs. They might not necessarily have the right planning, but they were done 20, 30, even 40 years ago. Now, when they come to sell that property today, it can be a little bit problematic. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh... How many people can buy four flats in one go? So the only people we buy will be investors. Yes. And not every investor. Well, if you are selling one single flat separately, they can be an investor and can be a normal homeowner. Yes. And so you get many more investors interested in willing to buy and you open and complete a new market to normal owners. Yes. And, and that one is when... Uh, and so this is the, the easier part, I mean, the entry level on title splitting. When it's already been converted, yes. yeah. the property... But you're just doing the paperwork part. The, only the paperwork part. So the biggest job is to your solicitor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the higher level for, for the students and the investors... And more advanced. Is, the, is more advanced is we find a, a large unit that is still one, not just single title, but it's still one unit whether it's commercial or residential, and you split it in different you units. Create you create multiple it. units. You, create, yeah. you physically, no? so now you have to pay Bob the Builder a bit, or maybe not you personally, you pay Bob the Builder to do the work, and uh, and you create a you know, nice big Victorian. So you mentioned you know, this, there are a lot of these big Victorian houses that have already been converted. Yes. But there are still a number of Victorian houses that are not being converted. Mm. So there are, I don't know, six bedroom houses on three levels. Or a four bedroom house on two levels, but you know there is being Victorians they have huge lofts or, or uh, huge uh, basements with natural light, and you can create uh, four, six, mm. eight flats out of it. So maybe you spend, you buy it for two hundred thousand pounds, you spend another two hundred thousand pounds, and now you have eight flats worth one hundred thousand pounds each. Mm. So you double the value, and. And, and then again, you decide, am I keeping them or am I selling them? Yes. Yeah. And if you're combining that with a more creative strategy, then, you know, oh, yeah. that opens up the uh, door. Yeah, to that is often hope. the case. One, yeah. Once you become proficient with creative strategies, often, and, and, and I see you've done it many times because I'm the solicitor behind it, you combine different creative yeah. strategies together, you know, a bit of an assisted sale with a bit of like deducting and, uh, and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, we could spend hours and hours talking about this, but the thing is, you are going to be spending hours and hours talking about this. I you am. could be doing this every week. 
So you're going to be running a masterclass every week. That link we're going to put on the screen and also in the uh, description as well. But before we finish, let's talk about one one more strategy, uh, which uh, I, I have a little bit of experience of, not a huge amount, commercial conversion. Yes. So a commercial conversion is, is a more advanced strategy for uh, more seasoned investors. I'm not saying that people that are at the beginning of the journey shouldn't do it, but they definitely need much more hand -held. It's a bit more it's complex. Bigger. It's more complex, it needs more money, and, uh, and the setter is not the kind of strategy that you go with closed eyes. Yes. So uh, here we take advantage of the fact that, in, especially since COVID, uh, value of commercial units have dropped. Because we are learned that we not we don't need offices to work in, mm. and we don't need uh, to go out to do our shoppings, and so uh, let alone pubs, you know. <laughs> well, okay, but you of course you There's didn't a, drink even before, <laughs> even before COVID, <laughs> and uh, I didn't drink either because uh, I'll uh, I rather get fat on food. But uh, uh, so there is a lot of commercial units that uh, value per square meter is much much cheaper than on residential because property. the demand has collapsed and the demand is collapsed so and i have as an investor let alone as a solicitor but as an investor i bought many units many commercial units pubs offices nightclubs uh, even a sex club is here. I mean, I didn't know it was a sex club. Right? It wasn't operating as a sex club when I bought it. It, it was, was closed down. It's closed down. Right. It was closed down. I, and I found it out after I bought it from the council. The, the agents never told me that the council because the council was very keen that I was converting it. They were so they're keen. Very they were, supportive. They were very. They were too supportive. I, I got suspicious. Said, well, actually, being Shimon Rudig and very direct, I said, you've been too nice to me. What am I missing? <laughs> you know, you know when you get suspicious, mm, well, I'm missing something yes. here. And says, oh, Mr. Rudig, because he what he used to be before. And I went, a nightclub, right? <laughs> and they were, you're right. I says, a what am I missing? <laughs> and very niche club. There was a nightclub with happy ending. And <laughs> <laughs> so, and I converted them in, in uh, either HMOs or flats, uh, by to lets, uh, since accommodations, uh, holiday lets. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a great strategy where you take advantage of the market yes. and the economy. And uh, and uh, you combine with the title splitting strategy, yes. and which goes you create various units, uh, and uh, or uh, or with the HMO strategy. So I converted the pub in several HMOs because mm -hmm. I think that is much better both for lending and exit strategies to have smaller HMOs than huge HMOs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, or I had one that I converted both there was some HMOs and some flats. So and 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 so I'm taking advantage. Of the market and the, on, on commercial units, and uh, and uh, combine it with the title splitting strategy, yes. like this, and add value, spend money, and, and make him a lot of money. Often people are looking for properties that are below market value or cheaper than, say, traditional price. But this is a very easy route into that because you are purchasing undervalued property essentially. Yes. Your conversion costs are going to be the same as any other property you might purchase, but actually your acquisition costs have been significantly lower per square foot. Absolutely. And so your end value, your profit margin will be way higher. Besides, you know, you you want to be in the market where you have a least competition as possible, because mm -hmm. the more competition brings the price up. Much less people buying commercial units than residential. And uh, and even those that buy commercial units don't necessarily convert them in flats, so they don't are not paying top money. Yes. And uh, let alone, uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, you, you mentioned quite correctly before the person says, oh, what did they do with themselves? Well, the chain of pubs uh, doesn't convert pubs. Mm. In, in the, the, they, they, That's not their line of business. They're their line of business. The guy that was, uh, 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 has offices, is not his line of business to have flats. And let alone the, the sex club has a lot of business to create uh, flats. And so they, they is not the business. It's like uh, I, I, when people tell me, oh, why will the vendor agree to that? Why do they don't do it themselves? Whether it is a simple assisted sale to a more complicated commercial conversion. It's like my my painter says, why didn't you paint your bedroom yourself? You would yes. have saved money. Because I don't want to do the painting. Yes. I don't know how to do the painting. I will make a mess of it. Yeah. <laughs> and and there will be paint all over the, the <laughs> furniture and on, 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 on and the kids have they will have be painted too, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a great note to uh, to end on, I think. 
absolutely that's what it's about it's about understanding that actually not everybody wants to do this and mm -hmm. that's where the opportunity exists absolutely um so your offices are based uh, near manchester yes uh but the legal firm operates throughout the uh country yeah i probably um, have more clients in south man in south spain because you know when okay. people will make money they like to live in south spain <laughs> yes who wants to live in much it's always raining and i'm white i didn't used to be white 28 years without sun i'm white you faded away i'm fading away i'm definitely fading away um and so what's the best way for people to reach out to you first of all emails email me uh, my email address is shimon at ms iphone law.co.uk there's going to be the link yeah we'll uh, or or befriend me on facebook yeah but e easiest thing would be to uh, each week now you're going to be running this uh, master class yes. to connect with you there you'll be sharing knowledge you'll be teaching strategies and you'll be doing some q a as well absolutely so click the link to to the webinars and come to the webinar it's free what well, what have you got to lose out of it <laughs> Shimon, thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Thank you.